Hi guys, my name is Jeremy Slumokot and today I am going to discuss one of the great and most influential philosophers in history and that is John Dewey. American philosopher, psychologist, and educational reformer whose ideas have been influential in education and social reform. He was one of the most prominent American scholars in the first half of the 20th century. Dewey was born in Burlington, Vermont on October 20, 1859 to Archibald Dewey, a merchant, Alucina Reich Dewey. He grew up in Burlington, was raised in the Congregationalist Church and attended public schools. After studying Latin and Greek in high school, Dewey entered the University of Vermont at 15 and graduated in 1879 at 19. After college, Dewey taught high school for two years in Oil City, Pennsylvania. Dewey decided to under attend graduate school in philosophy at Johns Hopkins University in 1882. In 1884, he accepted a faculty position at the University of Michigan with the help of George Sylvester. In 1894, Dewey joined the newly founded University of Chicago where he developed his belief in rational imperialism becoming associated with the newly emerging pragmatic philosophy. His time at the University of Chicago resulted in four essays collectively entitled Thought and Its Subject Matter, which was published with collected works from his college colleges at Chicago under the collective title Studies in Logical Theory. After leaving Michigan in 1904, Dewey remained at Columbia until retirement in 1930, where he produced 11 more books. John Dewey died of pneumonia in his home in New York City on June 1, 1952. Functional Psychology At the University of Michigan, Dewey published his first two books, Psychology, and Leibniz's New Essays Concerning the Human Understanding, both of which express Dewey's early commitment to British neo hegelianism In psychology, Dewey attempted a synthesis between idealism and exper experimental science. While still a professor of philosophy at Michigan, Dewey and his junior colleges, together with his students, began to reformulate psychology emphasizing the social environment on the activity of mind and behavior. The new style of psychology, later dubbed functional psychology, had a practical emphasis on action and application. In Dewey's article, The Reflex Arc Concept in Psychology, which appeared in Psychological Review in 1896, he reasons against the traditional stimulus response understanding of the reflex are in favor of a circular account in which what serves as stimulus. And what as response depends on how one considers the situation and depends on the unitary nature of sensory motor circuit. While he does not deny the existence of stimulus, sensation, and response, he disregards that they were separate, juxtaposed, events happening like links in a chain. He developed the idea that there is a coordination by which the stimulation is enriched by the results of previous experience. The response is modulated by sensorial experience. Dewey's psychological work reconstructed the components of human conduct, instincts, perceptions, habits, facts, emotions, and conscious thoughts, and this proved integral to later, mature statements about experience. Philosophy of Education Dewey's educational theories were presented in the following. Dewey continually argues that education and learning are social and interactive processes, and thus the school itself is a social institution 
through which social reform can and should take place. In addition, he believed that students thrive in an environment where they are allowed to experience and interact with the curriculum, and all students should have the opportunity to take part in their own learning. Dewey makes a strong case for the importance of education, not only as a place to gain content knowledge, but also as a place to learn how to live. In his eyes, the purpose of education should not revolve around the acquisition of predetermined set of skills, but rather the realization of one's full potential and the ability to use those skills for the quarter good. He notes that to prepare him for the future life means to give him command to himself. It means so to train him that he will have the full and ready use of all his capacities. Dewey goes on to acknowledge that education and schooling are instrumental in creating social change and reform. He notes that education is a regulation of the process of coming to share in the social consciousness and that the adjustment of individual activity on the basis of the social consciousness is the only sure method of social reconstruction. In The Child and the Curriculum 1902, Dewey discusses two major conflicting schools of thought regarding educational pedagogy. The first is centered on the curriculum and focuses almost solely on the subject matter to be taught. Dewey argues that the major flaw in this mythology is the inactivity of the student within this particular framework. The child is simply the immature being who is to be matured. He is the superficial being who is to be deepened. He argues that in order for education to be most effective, content must be presented in a way that allows the student to relate information to prior experiences, thus depending the connection with the new knowledge. Dewey was alarmed by the many of the child-centered excesses of educational school pedagogies, and he argued that too much reliance on the child could be equally detrimental to the learning process. In this second school of thought, we must take our stand with the child and our departure from him. It is he and not the subject matter which determines both quality and quantity of learning. According to Dewey, the potential flaw in this line of thinking is that minimizes the importance of the content as well as the role of the teacher. In order to rectify this dilemma, Dewey advocated for an educational structure that strikes a balance between delivering knowledge while also taking into account the interests and experiences of the student. He notes that the child and the curriculum are simply two limits which defines a single process, just as two points define a straight line, so the present standpoint of the child and the facts and truths of studies define instruction. He argued that if knowledge comes from the impressions made upon us by natural objects, it is impossible to produce knowledge without the use of objects which impress the mind. Do we not only reimagine the way that the learning process should take place, but also the role that the teacher should play within that process? In the School and Society, Dewey, 1899, and Democracy of Education, Dewey, 1916, Dewey claims that rather than preparing citizens for ethical participation in society, schools cultivate passive pupils via insistence upon mastery and facts and disciplinary of bodies. Rather than preparing students to be reflective, autonomous, and ethical beings capable of arriving social truth through critical and intersubjective discourse, Schools prepare students for dual compliance with authoritarian work and political structures, discourage the pursuit of individual and communal inquiry, and perceive higher learning as a monopoly of the institution of education. For Dewey, the thing needful is improvement of education, not simply by turning out teachers who can do better than things that are necessarily to do, but rather by changing the concept of what constitutes education. For Dewey, the school and the classroom teacher, 
as a workforce and provider of a social service, have a unique responsibility to produce psychological and social goods that will lead to both present and future social progress. As Dewey notes, the business of the teacher is to produce a higher standard of intelligence in the community, and the object of the public school system is to make as large as possible the number of those who possess this intelligence. It is the business of teachers to help in producing many kinds of skills needed in contemporary life. If teachers are up to their work, they also aid in the production of character. According to Dewey, the profession of the classroom teacher is to produce the intelligence, skill, and character within each student so that the democratic community is composed of citizens who can think, do, and act intelligently and morally. Do we believe that a successful classroom teacher possesses a passion for knowledge and an intellectual curiosity in the materials and methods they teach? According to Dewey, it is not that the teacher out to strives to be a higher class scholar in all the subjects he or she has to teach. Rather, a teacher out to have an unusual love and aptitude in some one subject, history, mathematics, literature, science, and fine art, or whatever. A classroom teacher does not have to be scholar in all subjects. Rather, a genuine love in one will elicit a feel for genuine information and insights in all subject thought. The classroom teacher should be possessed by a recognition or responsibility for the constant study of schoolroom work, the constant study of children, of methods, of subject matter in its various adaptations to pupils. For Dewey, it is not enough for the classroom teacher to be a lifelong learner of the techniques and subject matters of education. She must aspire to share what she knows with others in her learning community. The best indicator of teacher quality, according to Dewey, is the ability to watch and respond to the movement of the mind and the keen awareness of the signs of the quality of the response he or her students exhibit with regard to the subject matter presented.